Well, it's widely considered to be one of the greatest pay-per-views WCW ever did in any era. I've actually never seen this show before I watched it to review, and I'm very glad that I did. It's the first ever Spring Stampede pay-per-view from April 17th, 1994 at the Rosemont Horizon in the Chicago, Illinois area. This show was nominated by Anthony Scats over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. The first ever Spring Stampede comes at a very pivotal time in WCW's history. It's in the twilight of their two world champion experiment. We're getting kind of the unknown, as yet unknown, last hurrahs of a couple of great in-ring workers whose careers were cut short due to injury, and of course the impending arrival of one Hulk Hogan, but that's for a little bit later in the calendar. 12,200 people packed the Rosemont Horizon. The show earned 125,000 pay-per-view buys, a buy rate of 0.53. Tony Schiavone and Bobby Heenan are on commentary. The brain had just jumped ship and joined WCW back in January at Clash the Champions 26. I love how that show, how mean Gene introduced him. Oh, this is the worst news I heard since my mother-in-law announced she was going to move in a year and a half ago. Heenan, won't you leave me alone? You follow me everywhere. And here's a bit of trivia I learned when researching this. Apparently, the dart match for this show features Danny Bonaducci in the ring in an actual match. So yes, former child star turned competitor in celebrity championship wrestling, among other several accolades, actually had a wrestling match years before that Hulk Hogan reality show. I would love to see footage of this. Mean Gene opens the show after a fantastic video package. Aaron Neville sings the national anthem. He's a friend of WCW's as he was a guest at Clash of the Champions 26 earlier. Also, Neville definitely rated Jesse Ventura's wardrobe for this look. In your opening match, Johnny B. Bad, dressed for the mean streets of Chicago, baby, taking on Diamond Dallas Page, accompanied by the Diamond Doll. Kimberly presents a gift to Heenan at ringside as the match begins, so Bob is a huge stand for DDP from here on out. DDP gets the jump on Bad, but then he gets clotheslined out of the ring. Bad on top. Cool little sequence here that sees Bad bridge out of a reverse chin lock. It's a big snapmare. Page takes over soon afterward. It's a big gut buster on Bad. Johnny gets out of the chin lock and hits a back suplex. A big comeback by Bad hits a flying head scissors, a big punch, a big dive, top rope sunset flip, very impressive, and Johnny wins. This opening match gets two out of five stars from me. It's a pretty short, pretty basic match. Babyface gets over to have the fans start off on a high note. Nothing too wild about this match, a pun not intended referring to Mark Marrow there, but it was still, you know, I've said before, it's always good if you're a wrestler to have a good five minute match, be able to do that, and these two did that. We see Mean Gene and Jesse Ventura on stage. Jesse says he's celebrating a big payday, and I wonder when he says that, is this tied to when he won uh, in a lawsuit against the World Wrestling Federation over video royalties? I don't think the timing adds up unless he got his payday much later after the trial actually occurred, but these two are just plugging the hotline and all the big matches for later in the night. Our next match is for the TV Championship. Michael Buffer doing the intros here as Lord Steven Regal with Sir William takes on Flying Brian. Pillman's not too far removed from the breakup of the Hollywood Blondes with stunning Steve Austin looking for some singles gold here. By the way, that breakup angle with Steve Austin, I think kind of peaked uh, just before this show at Clash 26 because you're going to have Brian Pillman versus Colonel Robert Parker, Austin's new manager, in a loser wears a chicken suit match. But my favorite part is not even the match itself. It's the pre-match promo Parker and Austin do earlier in the show where they kind of reverse roles. Like Austin's playing manager on this night and Parker's in his wrestling gear. And Steve Austin, master of impersonation, is doing a killer Robert Parker voice. The man that rules the world and to make sure that Flying Brian is wearing that chicken suit come Saturday night. Regal has held the championship since Fall Brawl back in September when he beat Ricky Steamboat for it. Recently on TV, Regal hit Pillman with a pile driver on the exposed concrete floor to add extra heat. Brian lights up Regal early on. Steve begs off, but Pillman just slaps him. Regal lures Pillman outside, starts to throw him to the barricade. Pillman with the comeback, wraps Regal's arm around the ring post. He seems to be distracted by Sir William, even though he's really not doing anything of note. Regal with a headbutt in the ring to take control. Heenan's headset goes out for a while, but he eventually gets it back. Regal with a sweet catch and flip onto Flying Brian. A Canadian backbreaker by Regal turns into a roll-up by Pillman in a two-count. Great leg hold into the STF. Backslide attempt by Pillman gets blocked. Another great submission. Brian fights out of it. They almost fall over mid-move, but Regal's able to tough it out and gets him up for the Regal roll. Lots more holds by Regal. Pillman keeps getting worked over. He starts throwing some punches. The crowd's fired up, only for Steve to get him back into the holds. Regal's looking to run the clock out with all these submissions. Brian gets back up and gets some hard-fought separation, hitting a 
drop kick. Both men are down. With a minute to go, Lord Steve goes for a flying nothing, but Pillman hits a drop kick in midair. Pillman's coming back. Both men tumble out of the ring with seconds to spare. Pillman decks Sir William, brings Regal back into the ring just as time expires. It's a draw, and that means Regal keeps the championship. I give this one three and a half stars out of five. I think Pillman was in danger in this match for just a little bit too long. I get they're trying to stretch out and try and meet the time limit draw, but there was just so many times where it's like, I think after a while the crowd began to lose interest because Regal just was so dominant. And every time there was a hope spot got snuffed out so quickly to the point where you can almost go too far with that and create some crowd apathy, but they were able to get back into it finally near the end of it. And the thing with the time limit finish, I feel that I've seen a lot of matches like that for the TV championship in this era and on time limit draws in the time I've been reviewing old WCW matches, so I'm kind of tired of seeing that finish, but be that as it may, I think this was a tremendous wrestling match. Some of the holds and some of the sequences we saw here, I had never seen before, and so it's just really cool to see these two in their prime working the way they did, so that was very enjoyable. Mean Gene's in the locker room with Colonel Robert Parker and Bunkhouse Buck, who Gene refers to as a fertilizer salesman. Get it? He smells. Parker's feeling good about the prospects of his clients this evening. He throws it over to Buck, who talks about his match with Dustin Rhodes, says that good things come for those who wait, and his number has come up. He starts to lose control here as Gene tosses it back to the ring. In a Chicago street fight, the Nasty Boys take on the team of Cactus Jack and Max Payne. The Nasty Boys, Brian Knobs and Jerry Sags, are your tag team champs in WCW, but this is non-title. However, these two teams have been beating the bejesus out of each other for months, so lots of animosity here. The fight begins in earnest. Payne's in the ring, wrestling Sags, Cactus Jack with Brian Knobs. Knobs swinging a broken pool cue around, then it's Jack's turn to club him with it. Sags with an open chair shot at the back of Payne. That looks unsafe. Jack fights back with the chair shot of his own. All four men brawl on the outside for a bit, Payne and Knobs fighting alongside the ramp. Back in the ring, Sags clotheslines Jack out of the ring. No guys, not the gimmick table. I love how the vendor's watching all this go down while he still has the foam finger on his hand. I love the commitment. Jack clatters Sags with a chair shot to the head. Max slams Sags through the merch. Cactus is whipped over the barricade, then is bludgeoned with a damn table. Then on the entrance ramp in my favorite spot in the match, Jack gives a table a vertical suplex onto Sags. Unbelievable. Nobs runs in and bashes a snow shovel on Jack's head. Sags goes for a pile driver on the table onto Cactus, but it breaks below them. So to make up for it, Foley just gets shoved off the ramp, takes a snap back bump on the floor right in his shoulder. Jesus. Sags got the shovel and just thwacks Cactus right in the face with it. My God. Pinfall. Nasty boys victorious. One more shot for the road on a max with the table. I give it four stars out of five. This was an ugly match, but a fun ugly match. And if you can take guys who are just beating the piss out of each other and just make it nonstop car crash entertainment, like I'm there, man, I'm hooked. And that's what this match was for me. It's kind of a wonder that no one bled in this thing. Obviously they're saving the blood for later in the show, which we'll get to, but man, it was just such a car crash spectacle from beginning to end. And I loved it. I loved watching that stuff, even though it looked very painful for some of the people involved. It is one of the standout matches of this pay per view, especially because it's so brutal. But something I learned when researching this show, I read a bit through Mick Foley's autobiography, and he talks about how this was supposed to be his last match in WCW for a while because he was supposed to get time off to get reconstructive surgery on the ear he had torn off in Germany. And so, just days after that show, though, after Spring Stampede, he's called back onto the road by Booker Ric Flair, and he's working shows with Vader, and they do a really piss poor job in bringing up their history and the fact that he lost an ear, and the commentary was all Excedrin headache number nine after the power bomb on the exposed floor and you know Cactus McFoley said that was enough and so he left the company to go to ECW and you know the rest is history. Back in the dressing room, Jesse the Body interviews Johnny B. Bad, who says he wants a shot at the winner of the Steve Austin Great Muda match for the U.S. title at Slamboree. We go to that match now as Stunning Steve defends the U.S. championship against the Great Muda, and yes, turns out this was Muda's WCW theme all along. The Great Muda! Muda, an occasional guest of WCW, he won the Battle Bowl earlier in the year. Austin won the U.S. Championship from Dustin Rhodes soon after his feud with Pillman died down. Had a sparring session with some unknown Japanese wrestlers as part of the build. My God, look at the traps on Muda, pal. Bobby Heenan on commentary with a note saying, you know, he, he acknowledges how big Muda is in Japan and that if he were to win the U.S. Championship tonight, the country is his, in his words. That's a powerful championship. Match begins very technical. Muda catches Austin in the abdominal stretch. We even get a Muda chant here. Muda 
Buddha's got an answer for everything early on. It breaks out of Austin's head scissors and makes Steve confer with Colonel Parker. Aaron Neville sitting next to Heenan on commentary, but never puts on the headset. Colonel Parker with a trip on Muda. Austin gets him out of the ring. Parker with a choke and Austin takes over. Very sneaky with his own abdominal stretch, but Muda powers out. Some more cheap shots by Parker here. Muda with some kicks and some suplexes. Goes up top, but he whiffs the missile drop kick. Austin goes for his new submission, the Hollywood and Vine, but Muda gets out. Muda hits the stun gun on the guy who uses it the most. Backspring elbow into the corner, a top rope hurricane rana. He kicks Parker off the apron, vaults Austin over the top rope, and whoopsie days, that's still a DQ here in WCW. He dives onto both of the heels to close out the segment. I give it two and a half stars out of five. I think the match started off slow and ended a kind of disappointing way. That over the top rope disqualification thing. It's the only time we see that happening tonight. Even though I feel there's a couple of times in the show throughout where you'll see that spot, say that same spot done and nothing's done about it. And not, it's not like in a street fight capacity either. So who knows anymore? But it was cool to see Great Muda making a rare American appearance, but it did kind of force WCW's hand because he's so infrequent, you knew he wasn't going to go back home with the championship. Jess Ventura, ponytail detective, backstage with Dustin Rhodes, what's going to go down with Bunkhouse Buck in the Bunkhouse match? What do you think of Buck beating up with the trophy? Dustin says there's a big difference between the T in Tennessee and the T in Texas and says he'll kick Buck's tail like his tail has never been kicked. The best part about this segment though is Michael Buffer jumping his cue a couple times in the ring announcing. Coming up next, ravishing and Rick now. Rude and the Stinger. Stay well, with us everybody, gentlemen. it's just going to get better. In your next match for the WCW International World Title, Rick Rude defends against the man called Stang. Forgive me as I try and make sense of the two world title situation here in WCW around this time. Okay, so in 1993, WCW split from the NWA after disagreements over how the world champion would be booked. Because this is the time they were doing those Disney MGM tapings uh, for months at a time. So you know, NWA didn't like the fact that the championship was changing hands. And then, you know, you'd have the different champs come out on these pre tapes months before the title changes actually went down. So the new WCW title that was made as a replacement for the big gold belt after Ric Flair left in 91 remained the world championship, but then the big gold belt, which had now been back in the company, was rechristened the international world title. I hope I was somewhat correct or somewhat in line with the actual lineage and the history of how these two world titles came about, uh, but nevertheless, all you need to know is that Rick Rude is the international champion defending against Sting here, and this feud with them goes way, way back. back when they were fighting for the U.S. Championship. Also, as recently as Super Brawl, uh, the previous pay-per-view, after a six-man cage match, uh, Rude hit Sting with a Rude Awakening after the bell had rung. And then in a contract signing for this particular match, Rude hit the move again with a belt assist. There's a kid in the front row with a sign that presents some nightmare fuel. Rude goes into his pre-match spiel, but then Harley Race shows up on behalf of Vader. He declares that Vader wants the winner of this match. Then Harley goes for a cheap shot on Sting, but Sting is too fast, throws Harley into the corner, Corner and out he goes. Rude goes in for an attack, but the Stinger gets the drop on him as well. Cool to see a guy in a robe taking a backdrop. Sting on top early on. The front chancery is countered by Rude into a drop onto the top rope and a clothesline. He puts Sting in the camel clutch. Rude with some posing, flexing the tuchus, goes back to the camel clutch. Sting stands up and gets him on his shoulders, but Rude counters with a nice roll up. Sting counters right back. The sleeper is applied. Rude breaks the hold because it's not good enough for Sting. Some right hands, but Sting powers up. Pants is Rude for a little bit, hits the atomic drop, goes for a reverse atomic, but doesn't get all of it, so let's do it again. Ref bump madness. The scorpion death lock is applied, but the referee is out. Out comes Harley back again, who's immediately backdropped by Sting. In comes Vader. Sting's a house of fire, taking on all three guys. President Nick Bockwinkle's at ringside, chastises Vader and Race on the outside. Harley's got the chair. Referee's still down. Harley goes to hit Sting, but he moves. Race hits Rude on accident mid neckbreaker attempt. Sting goes to the cover and wins. Is the new international champion. Why is Sting covered in blood all of a sudden? I also give this one three and a half stars. This is a fun match. I mean, Rude and Sting have some great chemistry as we've seen in their rivalry around this time. This is just another example of that. I think that the, the match is getting a bit too chaotic near the end, but sometimes overbooking can work. And I think it, it didn't hurt it too much. There was enough going on, sets up the conflict with Sting and Vader down the line. Rude is justified or he's like, he's, he's protected in his loss. He didn't lose clean to Sting. So in that respect, it does work. The feud between Sting and Rude was not over yet, but it did end 
prematurely. They fought for the title again in Japan in May. Rude would win the title back, but would injure his back in the process, running into the corner of a race platform after taking a dive from Sting. The title would be vacated. Sting and Vader would challenge for the vacant belt at Slamboree later that month. And then, of course, that means Rick Rude forced into early retirement, which is pretty sad. It's one of those careers, one of those cases of kind of like what if he was given more of a chance or if he was able to wrestle a lot longer. You know, we saw glimpses of his character in later years in ECW and WWF and back in WCW for a little bit before his passing. But man, it's just one of those things where you wish he could have had that fully extended run in the main event as one of the two world champions. He was never given a chance to really be that top guy in the Federation. He was a, a Intercontinental Champion, had some big feuds with the Warrior, of course. Uh, but yeah, in, in WCW, it was kind of like a second renaissance for him. And it's, yeah, really unfortunate he never got to really fully explore what could have been as like a tippity top singles guy for a prolonged period of time. Coming up next, the Bunkhouse match featuring Dustin Rhodes and the match's namesake, Bunkhouse Buck. Buck debuted recently as the latest recruit of Colonel Parker, who in real life is actually his cousin. Rhodes the running start and tackles Buck from the get-go, but as Dustin often does, he goes for the crossbody one too many times and misses the contact, rolls out of the ring. Parker gets his licks in. Buck hits Rhodes across the back with a wooden stick. Classic Buck snort, says Heenan on commentary. Dustin bleeding profusely as Buck continues to attack. This is the only reason why you wear white to a street fight. Dustin throws powder into the eyes of Buck and wants to make a big comeback. Psych, here's a belt right to the fucking head. Ouch. Buck whips the heck out of Dustin here. Blatant low blow in the corner. Buck with some more shots, but he misses the boot as Dustin gets out of the way. A big comeback. Rhodes hits Buck with the belt buckle and now both men are bloodied. Dustin takes off one of his cowboy boots and drives the heel into Buck's head. Whips Buck's bare back with the belt. Boy oh boy. Big elbows in the corner by the future gold dust. Hits the bulldog and goes to the cover, but Colonel Parker gets in Involved. He eats a suplex into the ring for his efforts. Dustin whips him. Parker slips Buck a foreign object. Why he has to hide that in a street fight, I have no idea. Buck with a loaded punch and wins. I give this one three and a half stars out of five. Like the Chicago street fight from earlier, this is also just a wild, entertaining, violent matchup here. I like the presentation of the Chicago street fight better just because of the more chaotic stuff. It was easier to follow this match because it was, you know, the focus was in the ring and it was just the two guys and, and Robert Parker and everything. But I think I just thought the, the wild spectacle of the Chicago street fight puts it just a bit above this one. If I did, you know, three quarter stars, I'd give this one three and three quarter stars. But three and a half is the way I'm going to give it for this one. Jesse's backstage with Rick Rude, who's pissed and looks grotesque as he yells about what happened earlier in that title match. He gets into it with Vader. Other wrestlers break it up. Jerry Sags almost showing his sag in Jerry's as he clings to a towel while breaking up the fight. And we go to that matchup next, Battle of the Big Boys, as Vader takes on the boss. I had two different jokes I wanted to do to kind of open this matchup. First off, it's boss time. And then there's the other one. If you ever take a trip down to Cobb County, Georgia, you better make sure that your train marks are in order. You're so hard time. Seriously, how did WCW get away with doing this gimmick for more than one week? It's the big boss man. He's called the boss. He's still a corrections officer. Sir. It is so close to the original. How did WCW not get slapped with a lawsuit on like the first hour they first aired that gimmick? Even the commentary screws up and calls him the boss man every once in a while for months after he debuts. Back at Super Brawl, the boss was the guest referee in the cage match between Vader and Ric Flair for the title. Boss got handcuffed by the baddies, but he eventually broke out and attacked Vader in retaliation, leading to this grudge match. The action begins in the ramp. Harley grabs Boss and Vader charges, but Boss moves. Harley's bumping all over the place tonight. What an avalanche. Vader's knocked in and out of the ring, but Vader's back on top on the ramp, slams Boss into the ring, then goes for a leaping dive over the rope, but Boss gets the knees up and Vader eats shit. Back on the outside, Vader's hurled over the barricade. Boss, they body slam in the ring. Vader comes back with some haymakers. We get what looks like a small miscommunication and Boss almost takes a header out of the ring. Vader's eye gets busted as he takes control of the match. It's a very physical match in case you can't tell. Every clothesline from both guys looks like they're just putting all their weight into them. Vader goes to the Vader bomb, but Boss catches him and hucks him back down. Boss tries to go for some kind of top rope DDT. Don't know what they were doing here. Another collision off the top rope doesn't look quite right. They go for it one more time, and it's a snap power slam out of the sky by Vader. The Vader bomb, but the Boss kicks out. The moon salt, and Vader finally wins. Boss recovers, though, and whomps Vader, and especially Harley Race the nightstick. Race takes a hell of a beating until President Bockwinkle finally gets in there and stops the violence. 
The most I can give this one is two and a half stars because it is botchy as hell. This match looks so sloppy at times, but they're beating the hell out of each other and it looks fun to watch. It's like a two-man version of the Chicago Street Fight. I hate to keep comparing it to these matches, but that's what I keep seeing here. It's a very physical confrontation and these two look like they're legitimately hurting each other and almost like killing themselves on more than one occasion in this matchup. But it's so entertaining to watch. Seeing Harley fly over the place for the boss is really impressive. It's just, it's, it's a really, just it's a fun unmatched, but oh my god, five more minutes and somebody would have their neck broke. Mean Jean's on stage, plugging the hotline, then after a hiccup in production, we go to Jesse Ventura backstage with The Bach and Nick Boswinkle. After what The Boss did earlier, the president takes his handcuffs, his badge, and even his name. That's one way of avoiding trademark infringement. The Boss would soon become the Guardian Angel before eventually going back to his original Crockett era name of Big Bubba Rogers. In your main event, a classic matchup revisited once again as the WCW champion Ric Flair defends against Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. It was in this building five years ago at Shy town Rumble, which I've also reviewed, where Steamboat beat Flair to become the world champ, part of that classic trilogy of matches that year. Here we are again. It's a rare instance of this feud being babyface versus babyface, because Flair is a good guy here at this point in WCW, but traditionally in his feud with Steamboat, he's always played the heel, because it's always been a battle of like lifestyles and, and philosophies and everything. Flair's the playboy, and Ricky Steamboat's the family man and whatnot. So they're both babyface here. Flair Flair, though, I would say is leaning more toward tweener in the program and in the build at this point. He will not become full-blown heel for at least several more weeks after this. Why might you ask? Well, there's a new guy coming to town. You might have heard him. He had some success up in New York, and now he's going to come see how the big boys play. Hulk Hogan is on his way to WCW. He's not officially signed yet, but he's all but signed at this point. His name comes up occasionally in promos and on commentary. When's Hogan going to show up? Flair even offers Hogan a front row seat to attend tonight's match, but he's not there. He's probably wrapping up Thunder in Paradise. Some classic grabs to start us off. Steamboat eventually slaps Flair out of the corner, which is a huge reaction. Flair's drop kicked out of the ring, and then a big karate chop from the top rope back inside. Flair with some hair grabs. Steamboat kips up. They exchange chops in the corner. I love this little move here where Steamboat doesn't jump over Flair on the drop down, just goes right back into the headlock. Lots of ways to get out of the hole to get back into it. Flair takes over again when Steamboat misses a drop kick. He drops the knee on Ricky's head, and Bobby Heenan on commentary goes, I smell pineapple juice. Like, what the what kind of weird racist comment is that? Repeated pinfall attempts by Flair and some kickouts coming off the ropes. Both men topple over the top rope, but that's not a disqualification. Flair goes for a pile driver on the floor, but Ricky reverses into a backdrop. A second rope superplex by Steamboat in the ring goes on a big run, even blocks a knee drop and puts Flair in his own figure four after much struggling Flair with the eye poke to get out of it. Steamboat with many pinfall attempts. Flair kicks out. There's more fighting. Steamboat jumps off the apron, but Flair catches him with the boot. More back and forth. Steamboat with the top rope cross body. Flair barely escapes it though. Classic Flair spot where he's beeled off the top. Steamboat with a splash, but he misses. Flair's back on top, goes to the figure four. Ricky fights it, but Flair gets it in and there's a rope break. Another superplex, this time from the tippity top rope. Steamboat crawls over for a cover and a two count. Referee's knocked out of position in a roll up attempt and Flair kicks out. Steamboat's got the double chicken wing, the same move he won the title with five years earlier, allegedly. Not true. Flair falls down, but on top of Steamboat, both men shoulders are down, and there's a three count. After some referee confusion, Nick Bockwinkle appears to confer with them. Nick Patrick awards the match to Flair. Bockwinkle explains on commentary that it was Steamboat's job to beat Rick in that situation, and the case of a draw, the decision goes to the champion. It's a wild finish, but the controversy with the title does not end there. This one gets four and a half stars out of five for me. This is objectively the best match of the night. Like I said, classic rivalry. These guys don't ever have bad matches, and it's been great to see how they've been able to continue the feud on after their initial trilogy in 89, how they've been able to keep it going and keep it interesting and exciting uh, well into the early 90s. It is a finish that we have seen plenty of times before in the NWA era, which is ironic as WCW is not part of the NWA anymore, but be that as it may, it was still, I just, the back and forth of these guys and just the, the chemistry these two have, you know, it's been talked about enough times by people who are far more qualified than I, so I won't go any further than that, but it's a pretty darn good match. There's still some confusion regarding the title here. It would be held up after that controversial finish. Flair and Steamboat had a rematch of the belt on Saturday night in May, which Flair would win. And soon after their feud, Steamboat transitioned into a U.S. title program with Stunning Steve. The two would wrestle a lot for the championship that August, and it was during this program where Steamboat injured his back and would have to also enter into early retirement as a result, very similar to how Rick Rude's career went out. So it's very unfortunate that Steamboat's career would end in kind of this anticlimactic way that it did uh, in the midst 
benefits of this program with, with Stunning Steve. Uh, Steamboat wouldn't get a proper like, in-ring send-off until many years later at WrestleMania 25, where he wrestled Chris Jericho alongside Jimmy Snuka and Roddy Piper in the handicap elimination match. And then the following month of Backlash, Jericho and Steamboat one on one, which was pretty good considering Steamboat had not really wrestled uh, at all until ni since, 90 since 94. So much like Rick Rude, it is very sad that Steamboat's career ended very shortly after this in this kind of anticlimactic way. But uh, the silver lining is at least Steamboat would get some closure and get one kind of like last hurrah many years later at uh, Mania 25 and Backlash uh, in 2009. As far as Ric Flair goes, like I said, at this point he was kind of in the tweener uh, realm. He was not full-blown heel, but not too long after this, Hulk Hogan would officially sign and have that ticker tape parade for his arrival in WCW. Flair would go full-blown heel and begin to feud with the Hulkster. They would go on to wrestle for the championship at Bash the Beach that July. My grade for the first ever WCW Spring Stampede pay-per-view is an A-. And when people say that this is one of the greatest shows WCW ever put on, believe them. Because after having seen this show for the first time this past week to review it, I tend to agree. I really enjoyed like most of the matches on this show. Like Johnny B. Bad and DDP and Steve Austin versus Muda, those weren't terrible matches, but in the case of the U.S. title match, the, the finish kind of sucked. And then there was DDP and Bad, which is, it was there, it was a plain match. But besides that, I was really really drawn into pretty much everything else on this show. A lot of high drama. Um, the wrestling was crisp when it wanted to be, and then the wrestling was like super just violent and hard to look away from when it wanted to be. So if you've never seen this show before, or you want to watch it again, you haven't caught it up in a while, I would recommend you watch it. Well, I hope you enjoyed my review of Spring Stampede 94. If you want to play a role in determining which shows I look at, be they good, bad, or somewhere in between, go to patreon.com slash wrestlingwithregret, become a $10 backer or above, and you'll have the chance to nominate classic shows for me to review. Next time on the Classic Review, well, I'm going to kind of give away next week's episode, next week's long-form episode. I'm looking at some really bad women's wrestling. That's going to be on the menu. So to kind of cleanse my palate after watching the terrible women's wrestling, we're going to watch some stuff from the other side of the Pacific Ocean. We're going to look at some Joshi action. And I'll tell you more about that as we get closer to that show. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.